Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Climate Action Webinar, Embodied Carbon in Construction and the Contractor's Role. AI California sincerely acknowledges the professional expertise our volunteer presenters provide. We greatly appreciate the diversity of perspectives and recognize that items presented in today's session may elicit a variety of responses. We strongly encourage attendees to be constructive in their comments and questions to the presenters and to one another to ensure we have a session that is productive in an environment that is a positive learning experience for everyone. AIA California has developed the Climate Action Webinar Series to address various climate action topics, methods, and case studies that also includes zero net carbon design, mandatory continuing education. We will provide links in the chat box where you can find our climate action webinars and free ZNCD on-demand education. To qualify for continuing education credit, AIA California provides the learning objectives for every webinar and includes them in the PDF presentation that can be made available online. A few quick housekeeping reminders. Today's session is being recorded and will be posted on the AIA California website, www.aiacalifornia.org, along with any additional resources. Today's session qualifies for one AIA HSW learning unit and zero net carbon design mandatory continuing education for those who stay on and watch live. AIA California staff will report these units for you and will send you a ZNCD certificate of completion. It can take several weeks before credits are posted and certificates are received. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions for today's presenters. You can also like a, like a question to move it to the top of the queue. Questions that are not answered in the webinar can be made available on our website. I'd now like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar. Suyama Bodanayaka, Associate AIA, is an Associate at Bauer Architects. Suyama is on the AIA California Climate Action Steering Committee as co-chair of Chapter Outreach and is the Director of Advocacy and Sustainability at AIA Orange County. Suyama's 20 plus year experience in architectural design and construction management includes the design and delivery of sustainable energy conscious projects. He integrates building decarbonization in his work and advocates for policies at a local and state level while supporting education and sustainable design practices for the design professional community. Siyama, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's program on embodied carbon in construction and the contractor's role. Embodied carbon or carbon emissions associated with building materials and construction accounts for at least 39% of energy related global carbon emissions on an annual basis. This session will explore some key strategies to reduce embodied carbon in construction projects, discuss the general contractor's role in addressing embodied carbon, and consider how embodied carbon affects project work, collaboration across project team members. When using the Q&A or chat functions today, please be respectful of each other and differing viewpoints. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Mark Chen is a sustainability manager at Skanska USA Building in Seattle, Washington. In his current role, Mark oversees Kanska's project level embodied carbon, construction activity carbon, and water and waste, eff waste efforts, as well as ILFI zero carbon, LEED, and salmon safe certification project delivery across multiple Skanska project portfolios. Prior to his sustainability role with Skanska, Mark spent three years in pre-construction and construction operations working on a large variety of projects including a living building challenge metal certified building. Next, we'll hear from Toga Tuta, lead AP. Toga is a sustainability director with Skanska USA building in Portland, Oregon. He has 15 years of multidisciplinary experience in sustainable design and construction, resource efficiency and project management. At Skanska, he oversees green construction efforts and leads carbon emissions, tracking and decarbonizing initiatives for both embodied and operational carbon nationwide. Tolga also supports various research efforts in sustainability and is an active member of advocacy groups such as the USGBC, Carbon Leadership Forum, and the Bay Area Sustainable Construction Leaders Group. Thank you both so much for being here. Tolga and Mark, please take it away. 
Thank you very much, Suyama. Let me share my screen and let's start. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Tolga. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are really happy to be part of this uh, Climate Action Webinar Series by AIA California. With my colleague, Mark, we put together a presentation for you uh, to discuss the urgent need um, to address embodied carbon in construction, explore general contractors' role in the process, and share real-life examples of how to implement best practices to address embodied carbon. And let me start with introducing our company, Skanska. So our company is one of the largest construction and project development companies in the world. Uh, we employ more than 30,000 employees worldwide. And we are originally a Swedish company founded in 1887 uh, with our headquarters in Stockholm, Sweden. And we have three business streams. Um, that's, those are construction, building, and heavy serial projects, commercial development, and residential development. And we have been around more than a century and has substantial international experience through different uh, types of projects, sizes, complexities of construction and development projects. And we have offices all over the Nordics in the United Kingdom, East Europe, and United States. And specifically in the United States, we have 30 corporate offices around the states, uh, including our offices in California, um, in Los Angeles and San Francisco. And let me talk about sustainability here because sustainability is really at the core of our business, a large portfolio of our projects, first year green building certification, and that's why carbon emissions is always a part of the discussion. However, let me especially emphasize our climate target in our company as it is closely related to the topic today and since it's very unique. As a construction and development company, our main climate goal is to transition to low carbon construction uh, across all our projects and ultimately reach net zero carbon emissions by 2045. And we started tracking and reporting our own carbon emissions in 2015 to establish a baseline. And as of today, we actively reduce our emissions by half and getting close to our interim goal by 2030 to reduce it uh, by 70%. And as you can imagine, for a construction company to have a net zero carbon emissions goal is a very aggressive target, considering the impact we typically have on the environment and carbon intensity of our actions. Therefore, it's really key for us to achieve carbon emissions reduction in all areas in construction, including embedded carbon. That's why we look forward to share the lessons uh, learned and best practices in our journey so far. So let's start with uh, the definition of embodied carbon. Historically, uh, the ambitious drive to zero carbon emissions building really has focused on reducing carbon emissions during the in-use phase uh, of the building uh, from the energy use of heating, cooling, and lighting of buildings. And we call these emissions operational carbon emissions. And uh, we have been trying to reduce these operational carbon emissions through two strategies, like adoption of energy efficient systems to reduce energy demand, and also increasing the portfolio of renewable energy sources to tackle the supply side. Um, and if we focus in California, Title 24 building energy efficiency standards really lowered the uh, energy and therefore the carbon intensity of our buildings in California. In the meantime, there are several incentives, policies, and programs across California to push the limits for renewable energy sources as well. However, there's another component of carbon emissions that are kind of less well understood and not yet extensively incorporated into the practice, and that component is called embedded carbon emissions. And let me try to move this. Okay. And that component, as I mentioned, is embedded carbon emissions, which are the amount of carbon emissions emitted during the extraction of raw materials, manufacturing of our building products, uh, transportation of those materials from the sources to the factories and then construction sites, and any kind of emissions happening during the construction activities. And at the end of uh, life scenarios for buildings, for disposal of building materials through demolition and recycling. So the embodied carbon emissions from buildings alone are responsible for around 11% of annual global carbon emissions as of today. However, since we have been 
focusing on operational carbon emissions, and there's already programs, policies, and infrastructure to tackle operational carbon. Uh, operational carbon emissions has been decreasing over time from the intensity perspective. However, embodied carbon will really make up a large portion of emissions unless it's addressed in the near future. And based on the current projections, it is expected that the embedded carbon emissions will represent about half of the global new construction related carbon emissions by 2050. Therefore, tackling embedded carbon is the next big hurdle for the construction industry. When we talk about embedded carbon, it's important to highlight the importance of environmental product declarations or EPDs. Uh, these are basically a third party verified environmental impact nutrition labels for a material. Um, let's say you are on a diet and trying to lose some weight. Nutrition facts labels can really help you to compare like different packaged foods to identify the ones that, are, that have low carbs per serving size and healthier for you. And EPDs can be helpful for us on the construction uh, side, similar to nutrition facts. In construction, we can utilize EPDs to identify the products that serve the same function, but has lower global warming potential and embodied carbon per declared unit. And therefore, this process can help us to reduce embodied carbon footprint on our projects. Unlike um, operational carbon, calculating the actual embodied carbon can be tricky. Um, to calculate the operational carbon on your building, you can basically look for the amount of energy used by your building from your utility bills. Uh, there's very good research out there to exactly show the carbon footprint of your like grid in your location. So it's relatively simple math to calculate the operational carbon footprint. However, embedded carbon footprint can be a bit tricky considering there are many stages of the life cycle of a building that has an impact on the embedded carbon front. And the global warming potential that we see on the EPDs show the life cycle impact of the product. However, while all EPDs kind of disclose uh, the emissions related to the product stage of a product, which is the A1 through A3 stages, and we call uh, this stage cradle to gate, uh, EPDs rarely include the information for other stages uh, due to data availability, practical reasons, et cetera. So it's really important to keep in mind when we talk about the embedded carbon footprint of our projects based on EPDs, we have to keep uh, limitations in mind and be clear about the numbers uh, that we are talking about. So moving into the um, policy side of things. So I think all of us are here for a reason. You know, this is an AIA climate webinar. I'm sure most or all of you here um, care about sustainability and addressing carbon emissions. Um, but let's pretend that none of us do. And this is purely just about, you know, what's coming down the pipeline on a public policy perspective. Um, so like we're showing on this slide, you know, I think, especially in the state of California, there's a lot of policy um, either being developed or already implemented that is pushing this topic of embodied carbon. And so we're just putting some of these examples on the slide just to illustrate that, um, that point. Of course, you can all you know, go online and read up about these different um, commitments and pieces of policy. But again, I think you know, if you're from the outside looking in and not actively paying attention to this, it's something that you probably need to be paying attention to here in the next few years, only because you know, on a public policy perspective, um, it's starting to come to the forefront. And um, like with a lot of things, it seems like California is kind of leading the way um, on the policy and legislation side. And then, you know, I'm sure a lot of you heard about the Inflation Reduction Act. That's that bottom right section. Um, that was the federal government's um, package around you know, it's it's named a certain way for a reason, but it really does address a lot of this embodied carbon information. Um, so again, you know, this makes for great nighttime reading because it's long and is really good at, you know, putting people asleep, but it's, uh, it is also really important um, as far as, you know, understanding the direction that uh, our state and federal governments are going with some of this embodied carbon work. And so again, once you get outside of the California footprint, you know, we talked about the federal government package, um, but there are also, you know, 
Tolga and myself, we sit in our Skanska, Washington and Oregon offices, um, also supporting some projects on the West Coast. But I mean, as you can see from this map, you know, there are states that have already passed and implemented legislation around embodied carbon, but there are plenty of states that have um, either pieces of legislation that are um, still sitting in for review, um, or at least city level policy that, have, that has been passed. Um, so it's interesting to see this national um, snapshot of where our country is at. And again, you know, if, if you're not paying attention to the embodied carbon side of um, you know, the carbon emissions equation already, um, just based on the fact alone that um, state and federal and city level governments are starting to ask for this and pass legislation around it is a pretty key indicator for the future. So I'm going to hit on, you know, moving away from the policy side, more on the uh, stakeholder and team workflow side. You know, I'm sure all of you have heard a presentation or talked to general contractors that say, you know, involve us early, involve us early, involve us early. Um, same concept for embodied carbon. And I think across all of the different project team members, you know, the same holds true. You know, the earlier we can all start talking about this topic, set goals, um, set deliverables, set expectations, um, the more opportunity that we actually have to influence the project. Um, and so I don't think we need to go too into detail about that, but it's, you know, it's one of those things that, um, you know, it's kind of intuitive for us at this point when it comes to uh, things around sustainability. And so, of course, with early engagement and again, getting the whole team involved early on, a lot of it you know, realistically comes down to our clients and our owners also buying in. Um, I'm sure a lot of us can um, sympathize with the statement that, you know, it can be really hard to achieve um, ambitious goals if our owner isn't bought in or at least isn't um, well educated on the topic. And so, you know, our hope is that through all this embodied carbon education, you know, we're starting to see a lot of owner groups that are also um, trying to address their embodied carbon. You know, for them, it's truly their supply chain emissions. And so, you know, there's an owner's can group that is um, kind of set up through the Carbon Leadership Forum and also kind of indirectly through the EC3 tool that Tolga will talk about here in a little bit. Um, but you can see just some of the, the logos and names that are um, in that group. And this is really just a, a group of owners and developers that um, have committed to addressing their embodied carbon emissions and their own developments and builds. Um, and so again, I think having, you know, like with everything, having the owner on board and drinking the Kool-Aid is really, really important to actually um, succeeding on a project. And so part of that owners can network is that, you know, that group of logos and um, companies that were on that last slide, you know, they've come together and at least put together an, an initial framework around what project teams can and should be doing at each phase in the, the project to address embodied carbon. And you can see, so I know the text is really small, it might be hard to see, but over on the right is kind of a matrix of all the different stakeholders on a team. So um, the construction manager, or general contractor, consultant, architect, structural engineer, um, and others who might be a part of the project, and kind of what each stakeholder's responsibility is and what it should be at different points in the pre-construction and construction process. Um, so again, I think this is also, this information is available online. If you just Google owners can and body carbon action plan, you should be able to access this. Um, so if you have owners out there who you've talked to about carbon emissions and embodied carbon, this is a good resource. Okay, so, you know, we just talked about policy, we just talked about early engagement. So once you're actually in the process, you know, once you have a project, a real project, and you're in pre-construction, um, what are some of the key steps, especially for us as a general contractor on planning? So I, I mentioned before establishing firm goals and benchmarks at the beginning of the project. That way everyone has a good understanding of what we're measuring success, success from is really important. And so that can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, Tolga will talk about 
how we've approached it in the past. Personally, I think tracking embodied carbon, similar to how we track a cost per square foot is really powerful. So tracking it as a, a kilograms of CO2 emissions per square foot, um, that's kind of my favorite benchmark. So, you know, you start at a certain um, CO2 per square foot, and then you set goals around, you know, as you go through design and construction, how much do you want to reduce that by? Um, so a lot of that, you know, a few key strategies, the most intuitive one is obviously to maximize your structural system efficiency. Um, there's no better embodied carbon strategy than just minimizing the amount of material you have in your building. Um, you know, we've ran lots of studies around the benefit of reusing existing buildings and existing structures. And so that's actually why, so this graph you're seeing right here with all the different bar charts and the colors, um, really what it's showing. So on the left is um, a project, you know, we kind of looked at a bunch of K through 12 work that we had completed over the last few years. What you're looking at on the very left is um, a K through 12 school that instead of um, demolishing the existing structure, just renovated their existing building, basically an interior fit out, and that was it. Versus on the far right was a brand new build. Um, you know, they demolished the existing school, built a brand new state-of-the-art um, high school. And so really what you're looking at between the bar on the far left and the far right is that potential differential in carbon emissions just from reusing an existing structure. And that's, you can see in the, the y-axis of that graph, that's all measured on a kilograms of CO2 per square foot basis. Um, so obviously, you know, reusing existing buildings is a big one. Another one that we've learned a lot about, and this will tie into our content later around construction emissions and the A4 and A5 stages that Tolga talked about with material transport to the job site and then the installation of our material on the job site. Um, there can be a huge amount of emissions just from earthwork and utilities and shoring systems. And that's, um, you know, when we're running, let's say a tally model, that's not usually a scope of emissions that gets captured in those tally models. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but minimizing earthwork and shoring is also a big, um, as far as early planning, a big opportunity. Um, and then also early outreach to manufacturers and just, um, again, establishing the project goals, talking to manufacturers and suppliers and talking about what's on the horizon as far as low carbon materials. So again, just to drive the point home and, um, you know, we, we've done a, a few webinars around this, really digging into this data, but um, the picture we're trying to paint here is again, when we reuse existing buildings, the embodied carbon benefit of doing so can vastly outweigh the operational emissions benefit of um, building a new structure that even if the new structure is highly, highly energy efficient. Um, so you can see, um, I know there's a lot of words here, but really this is showing the, the carbon payoff over um, the lifetime of a building. And so when you're reusing an existing building, this is showing that like in the Portland market for an urban village mixed use building, it would actually take um, an equivalent new building 80 years to pay off that, um, 80 years of operational emissions to pay off um, the embodied carbon that was put forth to build the new structure. Hopefully that makes sense. It's, it's a little bit complicated, but um, again, this is just driving the point home that reusing existing buildings is our lowest hanging fruit for um, emissions reductions. And I, I totally understand and acknowledge that that's reusing the existing building is not always the best fit for every project. Um, that's the reality, but as much as we can leverage this type of data, um, the better. Okay, so let's talk about the next stage, the pre-construction or design phase. So, in pre-construction or design phase, it's really key for the team to uh, perform life cycle assessment to accurately address embodied carbon. And life cycle assessment really helps uh, project teams to create an upfront carbon estimate, inform systems level design, and also determine the high impact material categories such as concrete, steel, rebar, and asphalt. And while uh, it's typically on the designer's uh, responsibility, as Mark uh, mentioned and highlighted, it's important for general contractors 
to have a seat on the table and provide feedback about supply chain, um, you know, cost, and different technical uh, feasibility of different scenarios here. And there are lots of different LCA tools out there. Um, some of the common ones are like Athena has been around for, for quite a while. Tele is quite popular uh, by the designers. Uh, one click LCA is another great tool out there. And EC3, I will talk about that in a minute. I wouldn't consider EC3 as a whole building life cycle assessment tool, uh, but it's part of the equation and I will uh, talk about that in a minute. But in this stage uh, with the life cycle assessment being done, it's important to create and refine the upfront uh, carbon estimate in the stage and refine it throughout the project. And as uh, Mark mentioned, reporting the embodied carbon in kilogram CO2 equivalent per square foot, uh, just like uh, the cost per square foot metric is uh, important at each estimate. So let me talk about EC3 specifically, since uh, we have been uh, really in movement with the development of this tool early on. Uh, EC3 was co-created by uh, Skanska, Microsoft, uh, Carbon Leadership Forum, and Sea Change Labs with the support of over 50 industry partners. Uh, it's the first free open access tool for uh, upfront embedded carbon assessment and benchmarking. And it's also uh, the first free open access database for EPDs. And if you're not familiar with the uh, tool itself, or if it, this is your first time hearing about it, uh, you can go to buildingtransparency.org website and register uh, free for the tool in 30 seconds and start playing around and uh, better understand uh, what, can, what kind of analysis you can do with the tool. And after the initial uh, development of the tool, a new nonprofit called Building Transparency has been established uh, to continue the development of the tool. And uh, the tool made publicly available in November 2019. But basically what EC3 does, uh, it's super helpful tool for general contractors like us. We can plug in our material quantity uh, from our estimates and we can pull different uh, environmental product declarations uh, for specific products or a range of products to find the averages. And the tool immediately calculates the the current embedded carbon estimate for our project. And it can also show uh, the embedded carbon reduction potential uh, if different products are selected. And we have been piloting this tool for, especially for our development uh, projects for a while. And since the beginning of this year, we made a commitment to provide initial like preliminary embedded carbon assessments on every new construction project over 53,000 square foot uh, using the tool. Uh, this is basically a conversation starter for our clients, even for projects that doesn't have any lead goals or any green building certification goals. We provide this estimate uh, to um, increase the knowledge and use it as a conversation starter, as I mentioned, with our clients. And these tools can really complement each other very well. Uh, while we are working on creating and refining an upfront carbon estimate throughout the project, for example, tally uh, in the early design stages can be used to understand if new building versus retrofit or uh, building reuse is the right way to go based on the embedded carbon footprint. And then in design development, uh, this different system selections can be made thanks to uh, tally analysis. Is steel or reinforced concrete or mass timber is a better option for, from a structural uh, system perspective. And then once we, come to the construction documentation phase, uh, we can you know, like import these numbers, these metrics to EC3 tool very easily, start working on our bill of materials, and then start refining the analysis uh, from the systems level to manufacturer and product level and see for the same kind of specifications, uh, what kind of products out there have the lower carbon footprint. And through this value engineering process, and following a smart procurement, uh, we can uh, achieve the lowest embedded carbon for our project by utilizing different tools um, throughout the process. So the next key steps in the project construction and design phase is creating and refining the low carbon specifications. Uh, again, these like establishing the specifications in 
uh, typically in designer's turf, but as general contractors, we have a lot to say. Um, these low carbon specifications can be prescriptive based, uh, can ask for EPDs and sourcing information from manufacturers through the submittal process and set expectations for procurement, or they can be performance based, uh, based on the life cycle assessment through EC3 or um, carbon leadership form baselines. Uh, these performance based specifications can set maximum uh, global warming potential thresholds for high impact materials and product categories so that we can control uh, these uh, big ticket items. And then setting bill of materials for embodied carbon tracking is key in this uh, phase. Then using uh, bid exhibits as lever with trades is another key strategy here to send the message to the market that this matters for, uh, for us and for our client for uh, the local projects. And when we talk about uh, creating low carbon specifications, we have to pay uh, special attention to concrete uh, because concrete is known as a high carbon intensive material, but really the problem child uh, among the ingredients of concrete mix is cement. And as you can see on two metrics on the right top side, cement alone responsible for almost 8% of global CO2 emissions. Um, and if if it, if it is ranked against individual countries, uh, cement industry is uh, the third largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world behind only China and USA, uh, which is crazy. So it's really important to create low carbon specifications. If you have a um, high amount of um, concrete uh, in your project. And the key here is less cement because less carbon. Uh, there are lots of strategies to achieve that. First of all, and this is applicable to any materials, uh, but knowing the options available to suppliers local to the project and for general contractor to start like supplier outreach in the stage is key. Specifying Portland limestone cement, uh, which we call type 1L instead of Portland cement is a good strategy because uh, Portland limestone cement has up to 15% of limestone versus 5% limestone in Portland cement, and it replaces cement one-on-one. -on -one. Another strategy is to substitute cement with supplementary cementitious materials or SCMs. Uh, typical SCMs are fly ash coming from power plants as a byproduct, or steel slag, again, coming as a byproduct from steel factories or glass pozzolan coming from glass factories. And in that way, we can repurpose waste product coming from other industries. And also SCMs can replace cement one-on-one. -on -one. But there are a couple of tricks and we have to be mindful about those in the specifications. Uh, when we introduce SCMs into the mix, uh, it kind of delays the curing process for concrete and therefore, uh, your concrete mix might not reach its compressive strength uh, value within the 28 days, which is typical in the industry. So it might lay your construction schedule and we general contractors have to be mindful about that and coordinate with our designers and structural designers. But for some uh, non-critical uh, building components like slabs, we can consider 56 day uh, strength values, uh, which will not impact the construction schedule, and we can increase the ratio of SCMs in concrete mixes. Um, here, performance versus prescriptive structural specs is also important and needs to be coordinated by a general contractor uh, with a structural designer because uh, prescriptive structural specs might not uh, allow high percentages of SCM, therefore limit the options down the road if it is not discussed early on. Selecting different mixes for different users uh, can uh, kind of enhance the options that the team might have. Uh, specifying hard, clean, and recycle, recycled and strong aggregates can further reduce the embedded carbon intensity of concrete mixes. Uh, kiln times matter. Uh, this is less of a problem these days, but um, it's important to coordinate that with manufacturers and understand um, their carbon emissions. Um, based on the EPDs. And the last but not least, uh, there are lots of carbon sequestration technologies are coming up in the market. For example, carbon cure is one of them, maybe you heard. Utilizing those kind of technologies can be key, but it's important to be mindful about those upcoming new technologies and ask about where the carbon is sourced from. For example, for carbon cure, 
uh, they inject carbon uh, in the with the mix plant for manufacturing uh, concrete mix. Uh, but it's important to know how the carbon is sourced and where it is coming from, etc., to better understand the um, the whole impact of the technology. And here, for example, you see one example from one of our confidential projects where our team achieved 70% glass pozzolan SCM uh, in their slab pool, uh, which is very rare in the industry. Let's continue talking about low carbon specifications. It's important to limit carbon intensive materials such as concrete, virgin steel, uh, aluminum, plastics, foam insulation. Uh, utilizing higher cycle content materials is key, and also choosing lower carbon alternatives such as mass timber, cork flooring, or hemp insulation that are made based on organic materials that will sequester carbon over time. And something to highlight here, it's not fair to blame an entire material category. Uh, when, when you think about like structural systems, typically reinforced concrete structures have the highest average carbon intensity than steel, than mass timber. But these materials with high average embedded carbon intensity doesn't mean um, there are not options to lower the embedded carbon intensity for those. Uh, and typical low carbon material alternatives doesn't guarantee they will have low embedded carbon. For example, a mass timber structure where the wood is sourced from a forest that is not sustainably managed, and maybe it's coming from overseas, from long distances. At the end, it might have like higher uh, carbon intensity in comparison to a steel um, alternative that's resourced and manufactured locally with renewable energy in the factory. So we have to be mindful about those for sure. And when we talk about these low carbon alternatives, the main question we are asked as general contractor is always, okay, that sounds great, but how much this is going to cost me? What's the cost premium? And I just want to highlight one study that we did with uh, Rocky Mountain Institute last year. Uh, we looked at um, different case scenarios and found that for low carbon alternatives, embedded carbon can be reduced significantly at little to no additional upfront cost. Uh, our case studies show that um, the embedded carbon savings potential of like 19 to 46 percent uh, can be achieved with less than one percent um, cost premium. Obviously, this can change over time, uh, but as a rule of thumb, we typically say up to 30 percent embedded carbon reduction in any project can be probably achieved by no cost or low cost solutions. And I will piggyback on Tolga's statement there around that RMI study. That's entirely predicated on us having the data we need to make those decisions, which is a, we'll get to that at the end of the presentation, but um, having the data is paramount. So anyways, moving into the construction phase and procurement phase, um, this is where a lot of the rubber meets the road for us as a general contractor. So the, the biggest change that we've tried to implement at Skanska, and I know other general contractors are starting to do this as well, is including embodied carbon results in our bid leveling. So when we, so here in the Pacific Northwest, we self-perform a lot of concrete. So we have a lot of access to our suppliers and the information behind all of this, but you know, other markets, it's something that we need to coordinate with um, our trade partners. But essentially, so in the EC3 tool, there's now a bid leveling function where we can input information similar to when we level um, our bid packages for cost. We can do that same exercise for embodied carbon, again, predicated on having EPD data um, and material quantity data from each of the bidders. So this is this graph that you're looking at. Um, I think for the purposes of this presentation, you can ignore the green bar, but look at the red and the blue bars. What's that? What that's showing in EC3 is the total cost or bid amount of that specific bidder's bid package and their proposal in red. And then the blue bar is their embodied carbon footprint based on the specific materials. In this case, the specific mix designs that each one of these concrete suppliers provided at time of bid. And so, you know, as much as we'd like to say, hey, we're always going to go with the low carbon supplier or um, bidder or subcontractor, 
Of course, it's not always going to be that easy, but this at least gives us the data to try and make that informed decision. So if we have a client who has these carbon goals, or if we're internally trying to chase certain carbon reduction goals, this at least gives us a snapshot in the ability to say, hey, if, if we award bidder two in this situation, um, that will be the best bidder to go with for the project on an embodied carbon perspective. Um, and it might, they might be a little bit more expensive than the, the low cost bidder, but then that becomes a part of the conversation of, you know, is this worth the project's extra expenditure of funds to achieve this embodied carbon reduction? Um, and so, as you can imagine, when it comes to our, our trade partners and, um, oh, Tolga, if you could go back to the slide real quick. So I think the most, almost the most powerful Part about this whole exercise is that again similar to costs we typically will provide our bidders feedback of hey you didn't win this job because you were 10 percent more expensive than um, the low bidder so we're trying to do the same thing now with carbon of saying hey this is how you looked against your competitor you were 25 percent higher on embodied carbon than your um, competitor who end up getting the project um, you know, how can we address this in the future? Because that will get, that gets the sub market's attention, that gets suppliers' attention, that will get manufacturers' attention. If they know that we are using this um, either for or against them during the bid process, and they could potentially be winning or losing work because of their performance, um, that's where we're hoping this whole market transformation side of it is going to come through. Because again, we need to show the market that this really matters and it's not just a check the box thing and there's no consequences if they don't pay attention. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. It, it's been really interesting sharing this with our, um, our subs and suppliers um, because it really ma it makes them pay attention a lot more for obvious reasons. And so construction, so we, we move past procurement. You know, for us as a general contractor, we have a contract executed, we begin work in the field. Um, you know, depending on the level of effort and again, the client's willingness to, you know, have someone like myself or Tolga actually tracking as built conditions during construction. Um, you know, we can do that too, because, I, and I think this is one of the most important parts because in reality, the atmosphere and the climate, I'm quoting um, someone who said this a long time ago, but it always stuck with me. The climate and the atmosphere doesn't really actually care what we have in a tally model or an EC3 model. It cares about what's actually been installed on our projects and what was actually bought. And as we all know, um, construction, there's a lot of change management. And so with a lot of change management comes a lot of potential for change in our carbon numbers and our actual carbon numbers. Um, so, you know, we've, we've been through a couple projects now where we've tracked, so if we have an RFI, some kind of cost event change order, we're also evaluating the carbon impact of that. And it's actually, um, it can be pretty substantial as you can imagine. Um, I'm sure all the architects in the room have, um, you know, had their fair share of experiences with general contractors that have all of these changes and all those changes of course, we'll shift our numbers and more importantly, shift the true emissions that go into the atmosphere. Um, so, you know, we have a whole process that we could talk about behind that, but, you know, I think tracking the as-built condition has been a very revealing part of this whole process. And so last, uh, Tolga talked about the A4 life cycle stage of embodied carbon, which is the material transport to our job sites. Um, and so this is another, there's a lot of unexplored territory here, but just tracking or requesting this information from our trades and suppliers is really important. Um, you can't reduce what you don't measure. So just understanding like, hey, you know, with our glazer, where is our curtain wall system coming from? Is it coming from overseas? Is it coming locally? Where is the actual flat glass being manufactured? Is that coming from overseas? Um, understand your baseline. And then from there, you know, really the strategies we've tried to implement is, of course, local sourcing. So if at all possible, we want to source domestically and close to the job site. Um, and I think a lot of the, the architects in the rooms and the designers in the room here can be a, a great partner for us on that. Um, I'm sure we have, I mean, we have many projects where we source internationally, right? But that some of that comes down to project specifications, availability, lots of different things. Um, 
So moving down the list, mode of transport. Um, I think one thing that we have started to pay attention to is how we're getting our materials to our job sites. Um, so here in the Pacific Northwest, there's not a lot of material manufacturing that goes on. So a lot of our stuff comes from the Midwest, the Southeast. Um, so we, we've looked at and successfully been able to rail transport some materials um, over to like us in the state of Washington, which is a huge carbon benefit over trucking. Um, and then the last kind of, as far as effectiveness, you know, I've ranked it one, two, three. So the last um, thing we can do is like fuel for our transport and our freight. Um, and so we'll talk about renewable diesel in a little bit, um, but that's not the same as biodiesel, but a low carbon diesel alternative um, for vehicles and equipment that's, as far as I know, very readily available in the California market. And after A4, what we have to tackle is uh, the A5 phase, which is um, the carbon emissions related to construction site activities. So it's important to tackle that as well for a general contractor. And a couple of key strategies here, well, reducing fossil fuel use with well efficient equipment. If you have generators, make sure they are like tier four or up, uh, they're highly efficient. Um, if you need to use like uh, diesel anyways, look for opportunities to substitute it with renewable diesel. Uh, some of our sites in California, in Oregon, for example, achieve that with almost no cost differential and reduce the uh, greenhouse gas emissions by diesel by about 40 to 50 percent easily. Uh, utilizing all electric and hybrid vehicles and equipment is key. Uh, many manufacturers are coming up with new models of their uh, equipment that are all electric or hybrid. Uh, we are working on this diligently, for example, with Volvo. Uh, we partnered a couple of years ago, actually, uh, to convert a site to electric site. Uh, we tested these um, all electric autonomous uh, hauling uh, trucks uh, to kind of look for the carbon emissions saving and we were able to reduce it by 98% in comparison to business as usual while reducing the operation cost by 40%, which was a great learning experience. And based on that, um, we are using this knowledge to you know, like replace uh, our um, fleet of equipment and vehicles with all electric versions. Uh, the main problem right now is a supply chain issue. Uh, these products are not coming to the market in, as uh, fast as possible in comparison to demand, but we were able to start procure like electric cranes, excavators, etc., in different uh, parts of the world. And obviously like looking for opportunities for on-site generation, uh, for renewable energy is key. Uh, it can be like solar powered lighting towers or solar generators on site. And if it's limited, there might be uh, potential opportunities to have an agreement with local utilities for uh, renewable energy purchase agreements. And then finally, the final step is minimizing waste for the end of life scenarios. And obviously uh, the critical piece here is to follow the waste hierarchy to reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, prefabrication is a great method to um, limit the waste generation on site. It can be done in a more uh, controlled environment in factories. Uh, so prefabrication is key for general contractors. Uh, Mark mentioned about the importance of material and building reuse uh, to reduce embodied carbon uh, and also minimize waste. Uh, On-site waste separation is key. Uh, the more waste we separate on site, the more control we have on waste and we can use this assets by uh, selling it to the vendors, make a lot of income, but also um, let the full potential for uh, reuse uh, for those kind of materials. Minimizing surplus is another key strategy. Uh, we sometimes overestimate materials because we don't want to take a risk uh, on site. If things go like wrong, we have to make sure like we procure a bit more than we need typically. And it's also, uh, common to purchase more materials for attic stock for future repairs, et cetera. But it's important for general contractors to not overestimate this uh, amount and minimize surplus. Uh, design for the construction is an interesting concept. We have to keep the end of life scenarios for our buildings. While this is mostly related to uh, designers responsibility, again, general contractors have a lot to say. Designing assemblies that can be easily demounted 
or uh, modular uh, can like really unlock the potential for deconstruction at the end of the life of the building. Uh, durability of products, specifying highly durable products is also important so that um, emissions related to replacement of those materials during the operational stage can be minimized. So let's wrap up with a couple of uh, actual case studies based on our actual projects. Let me start with this one. Since I'm in, from Portland, Oregon, this project is dear to me, uh, but uh, we are working with our partner Hoffman uh, on a Portland Airport project right now. Uh, the designer is ZGF. It's over $2 billion uh, renovation. And we are uh, building a new main terminal for the airport, which is scheduled to be completed in 2025. And the project is pursuing lead goal certification. It doesn't have a specific embodied carbon goal, but our client is very knowledgeable about the topic. So they encourage us to do as much as we can to reduce embodied carbon. So some of the strategies that we are implementing first is mass timber. Um, the airport will have a new uh, nine acre large span roofing system that's made entirely by mass timber. Uh, we regionally source more than 2.6 million board feet of glue lamb beams and heavy timber structure and over 400,000 square feet of mass plywood panels from Oregon Forest and neighboring uh, Washington State Forest for the airport main uh, terminal roof. So the regionally and sustainable source timber uh, kind of forms the base of the roof and uh, it's sourced from like small families, Pacific Northwest tribes and other landowners that contribute to, to this contribution. Uh, we are using a very advanced prefabrication and modular construction technique here. Um, so the crazy thing about this project, the airport has been number one airport in states for six or seven consecutive years, and they wanted to stay there during the construction. So the operation needs to continue. So we had to build the nine acre mass timber roof actually outside of the building. It was already built uh, about a half a mile away from the terminal building. So we, were, we had a very controlled environment to reduce waste. Um, and it has a very modular structure, so it can be deconstructed relatively easily in the future. And right now we are installing it on top of the existing roof in these modular forms, which we call cassettes. Another interesting case to reduce embedded carbon was the building reuse. Um, while we are expanding the main new terminal, uh, the Portland Airport had this concourse connector, which was connecting the two main concourses. It had a like moving walkway and walking path to transfer passengers from one concourse to another. And the initial idea to demolish this structure and recycle it, but our team was able to utilize um, an interesting, unique way of reuse. So let me show you a short video. We basically detach this entire structure and repurpose it as a bypass for our, uh, for our uh, passengers in our airport. So the entire structure is detached and then we were able to move them with these SPMTs, self-propelled modular transporters. To the other side of the airport, the entire structure is divided into two uh, and then this giant structure is moved to their uh, temporary location within three hours. And then right now, uh, all the passengers are using this structure now as a bypass to go around the construction uh, site in the main terminal. And we were able to reduce embedded carbon in the project because we didn't need new materials to uh, you know, build like new bypasses. And it had some other benefits as well, which we, I will talk about very soon. But it also had cost savings um, and it will be demolished and recycled at the end of the project. But right now for the four years uh, of construction, uh, it's serving us as a bypass and on two different parts of the airport. So uh, the benefits were like the Passengers cannot even understand they leave the building, go through the bypass because it's it was a part of the actual building. Um, the only place to notice that is that yellow uh, you know, entrances where we basically plug in the structure 
to the main building. And the structure already had like electrical, mechanical, etc. So we don't need to install those materials as well. We saved from those quantities of new materials. Another case study that I would like to talk about is Canada building. Uh, there's a lot to talk about about this structure uh, because it achieved very high level of sustainability. Um, it achieved LEED V for platinum certification. It achieved a leading building showing certification and became only the 28th in the world. It's net positive energy thanks to all the solar panels on the roof. It's net positive water thanks to the uh, rainwater catchment and reclamation system in the building. And we achieved net zero carbon as part of LBC. But the one I would like to highlight is it achieved net positive waste in a construction site. What I mean by that, uh, the the waste generated and ended up in landfill is actually lower than the amount of uh, materials that are reused and saved from landfill for this project. And it was a key part uh, for the overall carbon reduction, embedded carbon reduction for the project. And it represents about 16% of the overall uh, reduction. So to talk through, again, this is a confidential project um, here on the West Coast, but you know, we utilize the EC3 tool to, you know, that bid leveling process that I talked about earlier, where we, we evaluated our different bidders for different scopes of work on embodied carbon. Um, you know, we implemented that process as well as um, really dug deep with our design teams to find lower carbon solutions for our concrete mix designs, rebar, structural steel, um, curtain wall glass. In that picture, you're seeing some rigid insulation, um, as well as some of our carpet tile. Um, so we were able to achieve lots of great reductions, again, using that EC3 tool and leveraging the data within the tool and EPDs. And then on the construction activity side, and again, with the material transport and the uh, installation of materials on the job site, we were able to do some really great things around, again, using renewable diesel, um, like in this case for some of our concrete pump trucks that we were using to place our concrete. Um, we did things like entered um, essentially a, a renewable energy credit program with our utility provider for our temporary power that's in this case powering that tower crane over on the left in the distance. Um, we piloted some solar powered light towers. Um, it was a pretty big site so we weren't able to um, tie into our grid power everywhere for our lighting. So instead of using a, a mobile light tower that was uh, diesel fueled. Um, we were trying out these solar units. Um, and then, you know, some of the other things around local sourcing, um, rail transport, all of that kind of added up to a good amount of cumulative um, carbon emissions reduced from our construction activity side. Okay, I guess we have two minutes left, but just to wrap it up, um, some of the key steps that we have to implement is early engagement with key stakeholders, performing life cycle assessment to establish a baseline and identify opportunities early on, uh, creating and refining embedded carbon estimates throughout the project, uh, finding opportunities to reuse buildings entirely or materials, uh, establishing low carbon specifications to limit carbon intensive materials and also low carbon bid documents, and minimizing transportation, construction site, and waste related emissions as key and promoting also circular economy. And one last step, I guess, we didn't uh, highlight it here is carbon offsets because technically you can reduce embedded carbon so far. So the remaining amount needs to be offset. But today we want to focus on the uh, strategies to actively reduce embedded carbon uh, in construction sites. Thank you, Mark and Toga, for that informative presentation. Um, I know we have only one minute. so. There's lots of questions here. Um, we will try to get to them after the presentation. Um, we'll try to send you answers for the ones we cannot answer right, uh, today during the time that is allocated. Um, but a quick question, I, um, the PDX airport roof module system. Um, mm -hmm. Do you both want to talk about how the pre-manufactured pre buildings fit into the embodied carbon construction process? and? if there are any strategies that people can use or is there an advantage or not? I mean, there can be an advantage because uh, pre-manufactured building uh, suppliers have like really good um, 
market outreach and are working with many big suppliers. So they can identify opportunities to reduce embodied carbon much easily. And the operation is happening in a very controlled environment. So there are lots of opportunities to reduce waste and utilize that waste as a, you know, like reuse material uh, for future building use as well. Okay, that's cool. Um, Mark, you want to say something? Yeah, sir. I'm I'm frantically trying to answer some questions and also pay attention. Um, I think as far as our A4 and A5 construction activity emissions, prefab also has benefits there. Um, and it, we could probably talk for another 15 minutes about that. But I think as far as the install on site and, um, you know, when you're installing and putting together um, prefabricated units in a controlled environment, it takes out some of the sources of emissions that we would see otherwise on a job site. Right. Um, another question that comes up is um, working with consultants, MEP firm seems already aligned with high efficiency and low carbon goals. It, uh, it gets more difficult with civil and structural engineering uh, where code changes and liability concerns cause designs to go in the opposite direction when it comes to designing lower environmental impact buildings. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, MEP systems are a big portion of the equation. Uh, there's a lot of like good advancements in operational carbon emissions reduction, but like one missing part is the impact of refrigerants and the embedded carbon of MEP systems. And there's a lot of research going on right now to fill in that gap. Um, on the structural side, we have better data about like the key materials, uh, but um, again, I think as I listed here, some of the current barriers are education needs and learning curve. Like this is basically the early years of LEED certification. So there's lots of conversation needs to happen and we have to find a common ground to move forward. Awesome. Um, I think we are running out of time. So last question, um, recycling. So when it comes to recycling, do you use local recycling infrastructure? Um, or is there a system that Skanska uses specifically to manage? Um, it's waste? local, really, because every state, every city has a different network, different compliance policies. But like, for example, in Oregon, a couple of things that we do, like we work with drywall recyclers where they extract gypsum from drywall waste and use it as a soil enhancer and sell it to uh, the farmers, like dairy farmers in the region. There might be some other opportunities in other locations, but yeah, local network is really key. Uh, we don't use like national, uh, you know, waste haulers. Uh, it's based on local uh, requirements and opportunities. Well, to respect everybody's time, I want to give, be, give a big thank you to both of you, Mark and Tolga, uh, for an excellent presentation. For those of you who have made it this far, AIA California will submit you for a CE credit and will send you a ZNC certificate of completion. It may take several weeks before credits are posted and certificates are received. As always, more resources and tools can be found on AIA California's website. A big thank you to all of you for joining us today. We hope to see you at our next Climate Action webinar. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.